Hi, I'm Jenna Stewart. We're here at the Southern Ohio Museum today with Matt Marash, a photographer who was featured in our recent exhibition, Emulsion, which is an exhibition that uh, showcases film photography and film cameras and included a number of contemporary film photographers, including you. Well, thanks for, thanks for having me, Jenna. Yeah, I'm Matt Marash. I've been a film shooter for the last 15 years now and kind of uh, somehow surrounded my entire life in photography. I picked up a camera 15 years ago uh, as a means to an end. There was a school trip that was going on, so I picked that up, and by the end of it, I was obsessed with photography and kind of churned through all of these early digital cameras fast enough that I was like, there has to be a different way to work and maybe like concentrate and like, uh, you know, relish every frame you take a little bit more. And that's when I kind of discovered film. I picked up a, a little Hasselblad medium format camera and that just like sent me on this path where I was just chasing different processes and different ways to like slow down and take a like another look at things and that ended up being becoming uh, these even bigger cameras like large format stuff and that's what I still work with uh, to this day hiking around nature with this big old camera set up and just really taking in everything around me and taking a longer time to uh, to make each picture so w when was it that you first picked up photography? You said when you were a child, and then when, how old were you when that transition happened to um, film photography? Oh, so like, yeah, my earliest shooting with film was like on vacations and stuff as a kid, mm -hmm. but I really didn't experience photography and take it seriously until like late in college. Like it was um, the school trip that I wanted to remember was was one my last year in college. We were going to Japan all summer. So that was in 2008 uh, when I picked that up. And probably less than a year from there is when I had completely shifted over to film from digital. So I kind of turned through it. I, this was like early days of digital photography where like everybody's camera, it's like everybody's phone kind of feels the same right now, but yeah. even before that, all the earlier digital cameras were way worse, way slower, and the image looked identical to it. And the only thing that could really, in my opinion, make the image stand out was shooting it on this film stuff, which I had like no idea about until I dove headfirst into the camera and had a really supportive uh, digital photography professor who acknowledged how crazy I was and gave me access to the black and white darkroom at school. So that's kind of where it all started and it's kind of been, yeah, 2008, 2009, all the way through now. That's interesting. I actually, my father was a film photographer for a while. Um, and so I started out um, being very familiar with film, even when I was younger. And of course, we used digital cameras. He was also very into gadgets. So as soon as like we could get our hands on digital cameras, we had those. But you're right, they were not, they weren't great back then. Um, and so I started out um, in college in film photography, and then transitioned to digital because our film photography program was was being axed basically. Uh, which is interesting because right now I feel like we are seeing like the reemergence of film. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about that? Sure thing. Yeah, film is films had a bit of a roller coaster probably since yeah 2010 because that's when uh, so Polaroid had gone out in 2009. They filed for bankruptcy, got rid of a bunch of machines, and then Kodak they had their giant bankruptcy in 2010, and that just to a lot of people that was like, boom, that's the end of uh, film, it's, it's no more. But it kind of, that was like a low point and then it kind of, you know, there was a little bit coming back into it, maybe 2015, 2016, but really where film is at now, it hasn't been, film has never been bigger and this is like in the post 2010. So f the popularity of film right now is about where it was in, in like the mid 2000s when digital cameras first started to become a thing. And not because it's a better medium, it's just a different choice. Kind of like the same reason that vinyl is as big as it is right now. People are, as more and more of our lives are condensed to ones and zeros on a hard drive, more and more people are appreciating, hey, I have this physical object I can hold on to. And to your point about what's, what's going on in schools, I worked in camera retail. I worked at a camera store at Midwest Photo for about a decade in the, in the 2010s. And to see all of these schools getting rid of stuff 
and then buying it again because it was popular, and then selling it again, and then buying it again. Um, the best programs that are out there are the ones that were too stubborn to get rid of their gear, and they just kept adding to it. So now these students um, are seeing something that's always been there, but now they appreciate it. So uh, film is definitely going through a bit of a resurgence. I think some of it is definitely in like the, the younger millennial, Gen Z, just because uh, their lives, for the most part, have been a swift transition to digital, and in the case of some of the younger Gen Zs, the Gen Alphas, they were born with an, iP you know, an iPad in their hand, essentially, and they have just a completely different relationship. Um, they, they don't have this, um, this negative association with any of the length of these processes. They just appreciate a different result. So that's interesting. I feel like the convenience and accessibility of digital actually, you know, led to kind of the, the downturn of film, but you're saying some of that just like instant gratification has pushed people back into film because they're ready for something a little bit different. Is that right? Yeah, it's definitely the pacing that, that gets people there. So for some folks like myself, it's like pace and intentionality. It's like, okay, I'm going out to, to make something. And uh, thank goodness I can do something with a camera because I can't draw or anything or like paint to save my life. So uh, photography was kind of it as far as creative outlet goes. And yeah, people latch onto it for different things. Some folks on the extreme end are like, oh, it's because of privacy concerns. You know, they don't want, they want to hold on to their belongings. Um, myself, if it's not directly in front of me and I can't see it, touch it, feel it, um, it kind of doesn't exist. <laughs> it kind of goes away. So like uh, the example I always give is if, if you're uh, shifting, uh, if you're sifting through stuff in your attic mm -hmm. and you find a shoe box and inside that shoe box is a bunch of old photographs, the reaction you have to that is much different to if that shoe box contains a bunch of old hard drives or zip drives, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like I can, like four hours can just evaporate once I start going through like those old Polaroids and all those old printed photographs versus I look at this old digital technology and I go, oh God, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna be able to get anything off this? Is it still gonna work? And there's less of that with, with like shooting on film and printing that way. Well, um, what are some of the things that you really like about film and what are some of the things that are really difficult about working with film? Because there are some, there are some inconveniences that come along with film, right? Yeah, and since I shoot like the really crazy extreme, extreme end of it, I'm like, I'm not phased by the, the inconveniences of film. It, it's something that I embrace, but for me, the best part is it's completely hands-on. Um, and it's, it's almost like a responsibility thing too at the end of the day. Like if I get the shot, I feel like more of it is my fault in a positive or negative way. If I mess it up, it's on me. If I get it right, I feel like I had more to do with it than some mysterious algorithm that uh, an engineer put on the camera you know, uh, in some other country. So it's, it's just a very, very different thing. Digital's awesome, by the way. You're watching this on it. So I understand the irony that you're watching this with digital media. So there is there is a bit of a push-pull there, but uh, for me, my, like personally, I like working in a way where I'm intentionally doing something, I have something tactile to show, and it feels like I, I made something with my hands. Where do you see film going? Like, what, what do you perceive the future of film right now to be? Is it gonna continue to grow? Are some of the cost um, issues going to prevent it from ever growing the way that it had in the past? Um, are the environmental issues gonna prevent it from becoming uh, what it was in the past? Like, what, what do you just see the future of film photography as being? So you bring up a really good point. Like, film is, because it is a material thing, it has to be, it has to be made with raw materials, it has to be produced, so it does go through all of these different cycles and it touches many more hands. And that has gotten better, so like we're using less nasty chemicals to process our film, we're using different processes to, um, to, go, to handle the waste that's generated by that. I think color photography is way more worse than black and white photography. Black and white's not too bad. I have a septic tank at home and I can still work with black and white photography, so it's not terrible, but it, it is like a, a genuine concern. It's nowhere near what it was in like film's peak, which was like 2004, when nobody had a choice. Like digital was a very, very niche thing and everybody was shooting film because that's what they had. So 
it is like a concern, but I think where film ultimately is going to end up going is it's just going to be a more niche alternative than it is right now, just like vinyl. So the, nobody saw vinyl being the top medium for physical uh, audio media for the last four years running, and now it is. So I think it's always going to be an alternative, but film, because of how much mass production and how specialized these facilities are that handle it, so there's these giant mile-long coding facilities in Rochester and a couple over in Europe, we're dependent on some adjacent industries, namely motion picture. So I think as long as there are, you know, our tours that are shooting on, like a motion picture on film, like your Chris Nolans and, um, and Tarantino's and the like, we'll still have access to all the films we, we have today, but black and white is never gonna go away. I think black, you can almost think of black and white film like charcoal drawing. It's, it's just going to exist because it's pretty easy to make. There's even people now that are, you know, working with 3D printers and they're even making their own film manufacturing equipment for black and white. So it's, it's super niche and it's really not going anywhere, but color, go to the movies. The best thing you can do to support film is actually go to the movies and watch something projected on film. So, um, you know, the, the north side of Portsmouth has that really nice old theater, like just go watch projected film there. <laughs> very cool. Um, so there was a time when film became very inaccessible because mm -hmm. people weren't producing film and, um, you know, you have to find a film camera. Digital had just become so big that it was really difficult to afford to do film photography anymore. And, and I feel like it's gotten a little bit more accessible um, just because uh, manufacturers are starting to produce film more. Um, what, what do you think about that? Do you feel like it's a little bit easier right now to get into film if, if someone's interested? So that's always been a tough question. And, you know, having been on like a podcast about film photography for the last 11 years, that's the number one question is it's like, is now the time to get into film? And the answer to that question, just like a lot of like timely things in life, the best time is right now because stuff is always going to go up in complexity and price over time, especially when there's these manufacturing processes. So getting to film now, it's going to be better than it will be in, in two months and two years and all that. But it isn't, it definitely isn't what it was when I started. Like when I was picking up film, people were literally throwing out some of these cameras that are now going for just way, way, way more. There's less people making new cameras, so that part can be tricky. But in terms of the manufacture of the, the raw materials, the color film and black and white film, um, that's actually up, but it's up with these uh, producers of it that like, they went down to 10% 10, 10 or less capacity a decade ago, and they're trying to like figure it out. So it's always like this game of, uh, of catch up like we saw with the world over the last few years. So I think in probably in the next year or so, we're gonna see like a leveling out of, you know, the supply meeting said demand. And ugh, I don't know why this always turns into a conversation about economics, but it really, it's tied in. It's, economics is part of it. It's hard, it's hard to avoid that part of the conversation, right? Yeah, but I think film is, it's definitely not going away. Um, it's going to change. It's always going to change. But I think the li big limiting factor for folks is if there's a camera you've been, like, you have your eyes set on, just pick it up. <laughs> if it works, great, pick it up. Because there's almost no one that's making these cameras new. And that's going to be the huge thing. When somebody, like, repairs a camera, most of these places are just pulling parts from a working one. So that literally takes, like, two cameras away. <laughs> when something breaks. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, I think, what's going to get like kind of crazy hard to deal with. And the only reason this stuff still exists is because it was like made to last, it was made at a time when these were made to last a lifetime. And yes. we're, we're seeing this, the whole survivorship thing where like the cameras that everybody recommends are the ones that just happen to last 60 or 70 more years. Yeah, well, I definitely agree that if you see a camera that you like and you can afford a film camera, pick it up. Uh, if it works, great. If it doesn't work, put it on your bookshelf. It looks really cool. People will come in and they'll be like, wow, that's a cool person. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about specifically your work, mm -hmm. um, your influences, like what you like to photograph, what, what processes you like to use. And you also had mentioned a podcast, and mm -hmm. I, I think you're involved in some film photography projects, and if you could talk a little bit about that too. Sure. So uh, behind me is 
like a lot of my work right here, my little corner in the show. Um, in the words of my professor from college, Professor Jeff, why are you shooting so many freaking trees? So um, one thing that's nice about working with these big old timey cameras that are huge and a, like a bear to set up is everything is much slower and sometimes people may not react to the camera the right way or hold still for you and do that sort of thing. But I found nature is a lot easier to work in and uh, part of the part of my process has also become kind of a workout plan. So I'm hauling 60, 70 pounds worth of gear on this giant backpack right over here. And it's, it's my diet plan. Uh, film costs about the same as like a high-end gym membership and it kind of it kind of works. And if I do things right, I end up with a cool picture. So a lot of these are actually, well, except for the, col the color ones over here, uh, all of these are from, are from the Southern Ohio region. So um, starting in like the Hocking Hills and going a little bit further south. And a lot of that was just exploring and trying to appreciate the natural landscape of Ohio. Um, I'm not born in Ohio, but raised and spent a majority of my life there. Uh, started in Northwest Ohio and I'm in Columbus now. So at this rate, I'm gonna like die in Cincinnati. But always exploring like and trying to appreciate different uh, kind of those different biomes that were carved by the, the glaciers around here. And it's just really, really neat. So um, that's where a lot of the work comes from. I started actually doing a lot more portrait stuff and I'm kind of getting back into that here in 2023. So um, when I didn't know how to use my big, uh, my big large format camera, the one that like you put the cloth over your head and do all the crazy focusing, I started with people photography, but I, I didn't know how to use like lighting or anything yet. So I was traveling around for work and I found that a lot of small towns only had a, a handful of uh, like establishments you could walk into. And it was either post offices, taverns, and barber shops. And okay, so one of them I might find some, some people that are drunk, okay. One is gonna have federal officials that don't wanna be photographed and that leaves me with barber shops. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing about barber shops, there's someone always holding really still so they don't lose all their hair. And it worked out that I could take these long exposure pictures. So basically holding still because the camera and everything's slower, mm -hmm. they would hold still for the picture because they didn't wanna get a bad haircut. And I ended up traveling to almost 200 different barber shops all across the Eastern seaboard. And that was like my first project with the camera. And I'm kind of getting back into that, but more like now I'm working more with like artists and doing environmental portraits. So like a person in, in their space and um, you're creative. So you've probably, and you saw your dad's space that he worked in. Every creative has like, you know, bordering on hoarder level spaces. So I'm photographing artists in their like, in their unique working spaces with, with the camera again. So that's kind of where my, my work sits. And um, it's just what I'm interested at in, in the time. Um, you mentioned large format. Can mm -hmm. you kind of c explain for us like what, what that means uh, as yeah. opposed to other for well, Like what, it, what is a film format? Yeah. So film comes, uh, you know, we all think of film as like the, the roll, roll of film that comes in the canister and has the sprockets, your 35 millimeter film. Well, there's all the other larger formats that come from that, some that are still on roll films. And then from there, they go up larger and larger. And it just means uh, you're kind of graduating from your penny slots to your, uh, to your like 20, 20 and $50 uh, blackjack and poker tables. So things get a lot more expensive, but it's kind of a high risk, high reward scenario. You end up with a, a bigger imaging surface that allows you to make a really big sharp print or you can do another cool thing which is what most of these pictures are which is called a contact print so all of these uh, all of these five over here these are what are called contact prints i'm laying this big eight by ten inch negative down on the piece of paper and exposing it to light so i don't have to do any sort of enlargement because the enlargement is essentially done in the camera and I, actually i'm gonna go grab i think i have some stuff over here yeah so when you make a contact print, this is, this is one right here. This was a kind of a B-side print that I made down in uh, Halls Creek Woods. So it's only, a, only about 45 minutes north of here in Portsmouth. And this has like this black border and that's the outside of the, the negative where it's made. So I literally lay in, in the dark, well not in the dark, but under a red light in a dark room, I lay this sheet of paper inside this frame, which is called a contact print frame. You can see it's all dirty from all the chemicals and stuff over the years. This frame's over 100 years old. Wow. So 
I put my paper in here, and then I lay my negative over top that and expose it to a few seconds of light, and then I throw it through my black and white chemicals, and then in about five minutes, I have a finished print that's ready to go. Nice. That's great. I'm just going to set this here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so can you talk a little bit also about the different types of printing that you're doing? Is that yeah. So another thing that kind of goes hand in hand with some of these older processes, larger formats, uh, camera wise, you also start to delve into like the history of photography, which uh, photography wasn't always on plastic flexible film. It used to be shot on plates. Uh, this little self portrait I took of myself 13 years ago, that was done on, um, that, that's actually a physical like piece of glass. That's what's known as an ambrotype, where I coated a piece of glass with basically liquid bandage and some nasty metals mm -hmm. and expose it to light and that the print is made on the glass. There's also tin types which are on like aluminum or, or steel. And before then even, photographers would coat these really nasty combinations of metal on, like by hand with a brush onto paper and then load that in either into a camera or use that to contact print the negative. So I, I play around with the different processes. Um, sometimes I'll, you can see there's not a lot of color on here because many of the older processes for these older formats and older cameras tend to be black and white because these all predate black and white photography. Kind of like the, the joke that, you know, nothing was in color until the 1930s. Just the whole world was black and white. And um, these, these processes are pretty cool. Um, they're very funky and they use different chemicals, but the other nice thing about them is they, they really give you this hands-on, handcrafted kind of feel. So uh, there's one print um, here in, the, in my little corner. Uh, this one that looks a little brown up there, the one I shot at Christmas Rocks, that one's printed as what's known, a, known as a calotype. And the calotype is, it's using, um, what is that one using? That one's using iron as the metal instead of silver, which is what's in most uh, regular black and white prints. And that gives it kind of this rust color, like so you oxidize enough iron and you get that kind of orangish brown rust. Well, there's the brown print right there. Another one is Van Dyke Brown, which is another iron process. You can get uh, prints that have, have some copper in them, so they have like a blue tone to them. You can do all sorts of things. There's literal prints that you can use gold as the metal, so it gets like this really cool navy blue color. You can use platinum and palladium if you don't care about how much money you spend to make the print. So there's all sorts of uh, unique little processes. And some of these processes also tend to crisscross with things like printmaking, because those were around the time that printmaking was industrializing as well. And you can get into processes that are like, okay, is this a photo? Is this a printmaking print? You can really kind of get that mixed media feel. So the other thing about these, oh, oh but the, uh, by the way, these processes, any of the ones that are not using silver gelatin like these, those are what are known as alternative processes. Uh, basically ones that predate silver gelatin and you pretty much have to make it yourself because they haven't been commercially available for, well, dozens of years. In some of them, it's over a hundred years. They haven't been around. Um, I, I don't want to skip over talking about your podcast and oh. your and your your film projects and, and that sort of thing and just give our audience an idea of what you're doing. Oh, sure. So since about 2010, I've been all about advocating for all things film photography because I thought it was so much fun. There have to be other people that really enjoy this. And I found these crazy guys out of New Jersey and I was a super fan of their podcast early on called the Film Photography Podcast. And it turns out they needed someone that played around with a lot more medium and large format. So I kind of became the large format guy and that's uh, the Film Photography Podcast. It's, it's a show that's been going on since 2009 it's such an old podcast, we didn't even call it a podcast. For the first five years, we called it an internet radio show because we weren't sure what it would be called. And it, it fits because it's like a college radio show with like fart noises and sound effects and stuff. But uh, we have a fun time on there. Uh, the Film Photography Project, which is not just the podcast, but we also have a store that's dedicated to selling weird and funky films. So like we sell old Russian military surveillance films uh, that they used to use in like, yeah, like spy planes and stuff. We sell funky Eastern European films that were used for um, low budget filmmaking. Yeah, it's just all sorts of weird stuff and that's at the Film Photography Store. And then we also have on the, 
Uh, in addition to all that, we have a school donation program. So there's actually uh, six schools here in, uh, in Ohio that have already participated in it and 50 schools worldwide where any school can go to filmphotographyproject.com and if they need cameras for their rebuilding of a darkroom program, we receive donation cameras. We test them with batteries and then test them with film and then send them out to the school so they don't have to spend absurd amounts of money to get a program working again. And that's been a huge part of it. So, and you, we also, of course, take those donations too. So that's all at uh, filmphotographyproject.com. Well, that's really fascinating. I love to hear about like the school projects that you that you guys are doing. Um, I think that's really important outreach. Um, well, this has been really fascinating. I appreciate you coming in today. Uh, so thank you, Matt. And I believe we have some footage of you actually making some of these photographs. So that's going to be very cool. Oh yeah. So I guess I can provide a little a, li a little background. So. Um, in addition to all the other stuff, I, I, somehow, I sometimes find time to make videos to put up on YouTube as well. Uh, and that's at the Matt Marash YouTube channel. If you just type my last name, M-A-R-R-A-S-H, into YouTube, you will find hundreds of videos. Um, and yeah, um, I've got some footage of myself working out at the Christmas Rocks uh, off of... Um, uh, in Lancaster, Ohio, as well as uh, this this long uh, panoramic color print I made last spring in the uh, in the Hocking Hills. So some of my favorite places to go and uh, get my my workout with the uh, the big old timey cameras. Right. Well, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. This has been great. Still have the wide lens on.